Good evening, everyone. We just want to welcome you back again to our Back to the Basic Spring Revival for two weeks. We had a wonderful time last night, and we're hoping that everybody has a wonderful time tonight. It's been a, it's just been a powerful uplifting, and I know we can all use some uplifting spirit in these days and these times. Amen. Let us open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for giving us the opportunity just to be here, to be on this line. Lord, just renew our faith, renew our spirit. Take us back to the basics, Lord. We thank you. We bless, We ask for a blessing for each and every person on this time. Continue to provide for their family, their success for anything, whether it be health, physical, spiritual, mental, whatever the case may be. Lord, we ask that you just continue to touch each and every person in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to have a song sung by Miss Whitney Allen. Miss Whitney Allen. Thank you very much, Elder, for that uh, lovely intro. Um, tonight we're going to sing a hymn, of course. I think I'm going to incorporate hymns throughout the entire revival. I just feel like that is such uh, at the core of who we are as believers and as Christians. So tonight's hymn will be um, He Lives, and I hope that you'll be blessed and sing along with me um, as you're watching on Revival. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. For he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow ways. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow ways. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow ways. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart.
Amen. Amen. He lives in my heart. What a wonderful song. We've been blessed this during this ten, these 10 days that we're going to have, these two weeks. We have a health message every night. So we're going to introduce Elder Lacroce. Cruz. I hope I pronounced that right. But he's here. He's a man who's believed in helping others in the field of health. Osmond had help he has a he holds an associate degree in biological science from the extreme west indy college now known as north caribbean university this man has a desire to help us in the field of health he loves what he's doing so with no further ado let us hear the man amen everyone and i hope you had a, a great day today I'm going to share my screen right now for you. This evening, we'll be talking about food as fuel. Food as fuel. So food is a vital to our health. It provides the building blocks for growth, repair, and fuel for energy. It is the key element in the length and quality of your life and also of mine. Now, we, now, nutrition is a key component in the food that we eat because nutrition is the process of consuming and absorbing and using nutrients that are needed by our body for growth, for development, and to maintain the lifestyle that we live. Now, if we have a poor diet, it will contribute to certain things in our life. For example, we will gain weight. Some of us may experience heart disease, cancer, decrease energy, and the list goes on with all the diseases that we get when we have a poor diet. So consuming unhealthy food and also beverages like should um, like candies and cakes and highly processed foods can lead to weight gain, obesity, and other chronic conditions that put people at risk for at least 13 types of cancer, including endometrial, breast cancer, and also colorectal cancer. The risk for colorectal cancer is also associated with eating red um, processed meat. That's taken from the CDC. So here is basically a, a food pyramid. We have fats and oils and confectionery. There's protein, dairy, there's fruits and veggies, and also starches for energy. So carbohydrates, or we call it starch. It is the main food that gives you energy. It is found in foods like rice and bread and fruits and veggies. Yes, fruits and vegetables also has carbohydrates. Beverages, sweet uh, beverages that are sweetened, and also desserts. Now, our body breaks down the carbohydrates into glucose, and then the glucose into our blood sugar is the main source of energy for our body cells and tissues, and also for our organs. Protein. Now, proteins are made up of hundreds of or thousands of small units called amino acids. Now, they do most of the work in our cells and are required for the structure, the function, and the regulation of the body's tissues and organs. It helps with building our nerves and muscles. Now, protein that is found in plant foods such as beans and peas and potatoes and grains and seeds and nuts, and in small amounts in vegetables and fruits, they have been found to be far more superior than those that have been derived from animal sources. Then there's fruits. Now, fruits are an excellent source of essential vitamins and nutrients, and they are high in fiber. Fruits also provide a wide range of health-boosting antioxidants, including flavonoids. Now, eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables 
can reduce a person's risk for developing heart disease, cancer, inflammation, and also diabetes. Vegetables. Now, vegetables are an important source of many nutrients, including potassium, uh, folate, dietary fiber, and vitamin A and vitamin C. Now, a diet that is rich in vegetables and fruits can lower blood pressure. It can reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke, prevent some types of cancer, lower risk of eye and digestive problems, and have a positive effect upon your blood sugar, which can help keep your appetite in check. So eating non-starchy vegetables and fruits like apples and pears and green leafy vegetables may even promote weight loss. And I say amen to that. The low glycemic load prevents blood sugar spikes that can increase hunger. Omega-3s. They are essential fatty acids that are good for our brain, our cells, nails, and skin health. Omega-3 is found in flaxseed oil, fish oil. There's also omega-6, and that is found in nuts, sunflower, and safflower seeds, soy, sesame, and also in corn oil. Now, here is some aspects to a healthy diet. Number one, our diet should be adequate, meaning that it should provide enough energy and nutrients and fiber to support a person's health. A healthy diet should also be balanced, containing the right combination of foods from all of the food groups to provide the proper balance of nutrients. It should also be varied. That refers to eating many different types of foods within each food group. A healthy diet is not based on only one or a few specific foods or types of foods. We should, we should eat the rainbow of colors when it comes to our veggies and fruits. And a, a diet should be moderate, containing the right amounts of foods for maintaining proper weight, neither too much nor too little. So, to sum it all up, what is a balanced diet? One that includes a variety of nutrients, foods eaten in the right amounts, of, amounts at the right times to nourish the body. So here it is. This is the plate method which we recommend. You see that half of the plate, it has vegetables. A quarter of the plate, contains protein, and the other quarter contains starch. That's how we should eat and have our plates filled. Now, if we're going to drink anything, make sure the drink of choice is water. It was the original beverage that was given to man. You see, our bodies are about 70% water, and every cell in our body needs to be hydrated. Here's a fact. Most of the beverages out there contain sugar. We see that a can of Coca-Cola has about 10 spoonfuls of sugar. Apple juice contains about six teaspoons of sugar. Snapple lemon iced tea contains 14 teaspoons of sugar. Orange juice that we love so much contains 12 teaspoons of sugar. Only water, my brothers and sisters, has zero sugar in it. You are what you eat. And all of the cells and tissues in our bodies are formed by the food that we eat. The life is in the blood. That's found in the 70th chapter, verse 14 of Le Leviticus. And the food that you and I eat determines the health of our blood and the quality of our life. So here are some tips for optimum nutrition. One, adopt a plant-based diet. Two, use whole grains, brown rice instead of white rice. Eliminating rich foods containing sugar, fats, oils, and salt. Now studies have been shown from Loma Linda 
that males who are vegetarian live about 10 years longer than non-veggie men. They live to about 83 years of age, while those who eat meat on a high-rich diet live to about 73 years of, of age. For the women, they added an extra six years to their life helping them to reach 85 years of age. And I say amen to that. To continue on with the optimum nutrition, do not eat in between meals. Our meals should be spaced, eaten every five to six hours apart. Number five, eat two to three meals a day, making your supper the smallest. Remember, eat like a king for breakfast, a queen for lunch, and a pauper for supper. And number six, our supper should be eaten at least two to three hours before our bedtime. So now eating our meals too close to bedtime causes lots of negative effects. A study was done by Howard University revealed that late eating may increase hunger and our obesity risk. Obesity affects approximately 42% of the adult population within the United States. And it contributes to the onset of chronic diseases including diabetes, cancer, and other conditions. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, it says, Whatever therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the honor and glory of God. Amen and amen, amen. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, blessings, blessing. What a powerful message. Thank you, uh, Elder Lacroix. And I hope you learn and practice those counsel. Very informative. Now it is prayer time. I know many of you have your requests. And sometimes you question, why am I suffering? Why am I going through such hard time? In due time, you will see the answer to your question. Just be patient. Keep going at Jesus' feet. On your knees, you will see. Victory will be yours. Let us pray as we continue with our spring revival. Back to the basis tonight. Gracious Father, once again, we come before your throne of grace. So thank you for waking us up this morning to see the second day of the week, second evening of the or third evening of the week. We thank you, Father, for your mercy. When we were on the world, you protect us from accident. You watch our children when they were at school and you bring them home safe. And our loved ones who were at work, they got home safe. And those who still out there, Father, you continue to keep watch over them. So we give you praise and honor and glory because you are a merciful, a mighty, and a caring God, we thank you, Father. Thank you for these two weeks of a revival you sent for us, Father, to refresh uh, 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 back to the basics. Teaching us, Father, that you are the most essential part of our life. We thank you, Father, for these messages that you send for us night after night. And we thank you for what we are about to receive again tonight. Thank you, Father, for all our needs, that all our needs, all our problems you have solved, solved already for us, Father. Thank you as we come tonight to listen to another powerful spiritual meal. We ask, Father, that you soften our heart 
change necessary that need to be happen will happen speak to the heart of someone who have never heard you before they also can come and receive you into their heart and be saved oh father we ask you for forgiveness we do things against your will we ask you father to please have mercy on us thank you father for forgiving us Lord. and thank you for healing our bodies thank you for solving all our financial problems all our emotional problem father we put all of them into your care because we have no one else to turn to we thank you thank you father for solving and healing our bodies and we thank you for your men servant who's about to deliver a spiritual meal father we ask that you continue to bless him we continue to uh, use him in this part of the vineyard father we pray also for our family members wherever they are listening to whether in the americas in the caribbean in africa in europe in asia wherever they are listen to father i pray tonight that they receive a special blessing that the message that they are about to hear tonight father will enter their heart and produce positive result soon and very soon when you come with the trumps sound we all will be one rejoicing to meet you in the air bless us one more time keep us safe in jesus name we pray amen at this time just before we listen to us pastor pastor Carl Boer i think there is a, a video of his uh introduction uh we will ask our technician to play that video if it's available to play it for us then after the video the next voice you will hear will be our sister sister with me Allen who will be bless us with a special selection after sister Allen our pastor will come with a spiritual meal pastor Carl Brewer have a blessed night Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. Your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able and my God, come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail 
Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know, I know, you never will. Mm -hmm. Everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. A new wind is blowing right now. Breaking my heart of stone, taking over like a Jericho. And my walls are all crashing down. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle. And I know, I know, you never will. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle. And I know, I know, you never will. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You never will. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You can do it. You can do all things, oh Lord. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle. And I know, I know, you never will. You can do No, you never lost the battle. And I know, I know, you never will. I know, I know, you never will. I know, I know, you never Hallelujah. Indeed, we the, the Lord has never lost a battle and he never will. It is great to be in this place of worship this evening. Uh, I thank you so much, Sister Whitney, for that song. I, one of my favorite. I love that song. And as always, I'm always blessed having you uh, leading out in worship. Praise God for the, uh, the message in health uh, and uh, diet. Um, indeed, uh, as the saying goes, health is wealth, and we need to do what we can to take care of our bodies. Uh, indeed, uh, we are we are celebrating these next two weeks. Uh, as we look at this theme, Back to the Basics, we are celebrating uh, the, the God that we serve and the Savior, Jesus Christ, who, as we were reminded Saturday, uh, Saturday evening, when we kicked off our two-week uh, back to basics revival. He is a man, but he's more than just a man. Uh, and indeed, that is what uh, that's what the next two weeks is all about. Uh, we're looking at this person who is more than just a man. Um, tonight, I want to invite us as we're going to the word. Let's bow our heads together and we're going to seek the face of almighty God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are grateful for the opportunity to celebrate you in praise and thanksgiving and adoration. Lord, we're uh, grateful for the opportunity to study your word and learn more of uh, what you would have us to know and believe and do. 
We pray, Lord, that the spirit of the living God would be our teacher tonight. Speak to us from your word, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at John's Gospel, chapter 2. Uh, and so if you're following along, I'm going to be reading from John 2, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Very familiar passage here. Uh, the Bible says, the next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus's mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus's mother told him they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But Jesus's mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. So you got six uh, stone jars, each holding 20 to 30. So that's about 120 to 100 gallons of water that could be put in these stone jars for this wedding feast. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instruction. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first. He said, then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Um, after the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. On Saturday, we began by talking about the reality that Jesus is a man, but Jesus is more than a man. John 1 said he is the word of God or the expression of God. He always existed as God, but he was God who turned flesh and came and lived amongst us. And so when we, when we read the stories in the book of John, and of course, throughout the New Testament, but since we're looking at John, when we read the stories in John, John's point is to tell us, the reader, background information that the participants in the story don't know. They don't know who they're encountering when they meet Jesus. But we know he is a man, but he is more than just a man. And then in John 2, we looked at Jesus cleansing the temple last evening, Jesus cleansing the temple. And even when that occurred, the religious establishment said, what authority do you have to cleanse this temple? Why are you doing this? And Jesus had to indicate to them uh, that his authority is you can destroy the temple, but he's going to rebuild it in three days. And they said, there's no way you can do that. But we understand Jesus wasn't suggesting merely destroying the physical structure, but Jesus was pointing out that he was opening a new temple, a new system, a new religious establishment for how to interact and come in contact with Almighty God. Tonight, we're looking at the water that is turned to wine at the wedding feast. And, 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 and if you've been to a wedding, uh, you know that uh, weddings are exciting times. Those are uh, exuberant times. A wedding is a festive occasion. I'll tell you, as a pastor, one of my favorite things to do uh, is perform weddings. I get a kick out of it. Uh, I, I often try to crack some jokes a little bit to ease the stress and the pressure that the bride and the groom are going through during that day, because even though they are in love and, and they're 
excited about joining their lives together. Uh, there is also a little bit of anxiety often uh, during these occasions. And so uh, I always enjoy, you know, especially during that time when the, the preacher and the groom are standing up at the front and we're waiting for the bride to eventually come down. I usually reach over and crack some jokes to the groom who's standing up there waiting, uh, trying to help him relax a little bit. But the weddings that we attend are vastly different than the weddings that were attended in the time of Jesus. Understand that in those days, a wedding generally would last about seven days. And you're talking about people who are traveling not by plane, trains, and automobiles, but people who are traveling a much slower uh, mode of transportation. In other words, if you have guests who are coming from a long distance, they're not expecting to come a long distance and stay a day and then return home. No, they're expecting that it's going to be a long party, a long celebration. Furthermore, the expectation is that the groom, the groom is responsible for ensuring that everyone who comes to the feast, who comes to the celebration, has everything they need for the entirety of the party. In fact, in another instance, Jesus tells a parable of a groom inviting people for his wedding. And when he invites them, he not only gives them an invitation, he even provides for them clothing to wear to his wedding. Uh, you know, nowadays weddings are very expensive. I can only imagine how expensive, how much money was spent in order to have this kind of celebration, possibly providing clothing, absolutely providing food, and providing all of the drinks and wine and celebratory activities for all of your guests who are traveling all around the, 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 the country, who are traveling from all around the Roman Empire, to come here and celebrate with you uh, this, this wedding that's going to happen. And, and, and so the groom has a massive responsibility for providing for the guests. The Bible tells us Jesus and his disciples and Mary, Jesus's mother, are guests at this wedding, which probably indicates that they have some connection to the groom in this case. It is further evidence that they're related to the groom or possibly related to the groom, because when there's a problem that arises, Mary seems to be called upon. So we don't know if she's like a wedding coordinator or if she's like a, a sibling or an auntie to the groom, or is she like a godmom or something? We don't know. But what we do know is that crisis arises on the third day. Stay with me. Crisis arises on the third day of this wedding. In other words, you got guests who have come from all over the empire, who've come to celebrate, and the groom and his family are responsible for ensuring the party never stops. And halfway through the party, the party's about to stop. They run out of wine. Mary is called. Mary immediately summons her son Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, we got a problem. There's no more wine at the party. Now, from Jesus's perspective, Jesus hasn't done any miracles in the book of John yet. In other words, there is no evidence in the story that we're reading. There's no evidence yet that Jesus is more than just a man. There's, there's no miracles Jesus has done. There's, there's no special uh, uh, experiences that have happened. Yet the Bible tells us here at this wedding feast, Mary says, Jesus, we got a problem. We need a solution. Let me further uh, suggest that that that. Uh, not only has Jesus not done any miracles, but this isn't even a religious experience 
of, of any special sort. This isn't Jesus uh, uh, having uh, some, some, some sermon on the mount and someone is brought who's sick. This isn't Jesus coming down from the mount of transfiguration and you can see Jesus is glowing from his time in the presence of the Father and there's a demoniac at the foot of the mountain. No, this is Jesus just at a party. And before we try to make anything more of it, brothers and sisters, it's simply Jesus at a party. And can I just say as a side note, for every one of us who are born again Christians, who are believers in Jesus Christ, uh, that Christianity does not make you dull. It makes you actually have greater heightened senses toward that which is good. Christians should know how to have a good time. Christians who follow the lead of their master, Jesus, should know how to party. Jesus brings his boys, the disciples, to the party. And midway through the party, Mary, who has not been given any evidence yet that Jesus has special powers or abilities, Mary says, hey, Jesus, we got a problem. Jesus's response indicates that there is a transition that is happening relationally for Jesus. Jesus is not merely Mary's baby boy. Jesus is the son of Almighty God. And so Jesus says, listen, mother. No, he doesn't say that. He says, listen, woman. Uh, uh, that woman isn't a disrespectful term. I know I know. Uh, some of us, you read that story and you think to yourself, Jesus could have gotten a backhand. All he was saying was, ma'am. Ma'am, because Jesus is indicating in this instance and in this moment and in this season, there's a change that is happening relationally. He's not merely Mary's baby boy. Jesus is about his father's business and he's the son of God. And his response indicates, I got to be about my father's business. Even in this season where I'm at a party and in casual mode, he says, it's not my time yet. Uh, my time hasn't come yet. In other words, my father hasn't indicated that it's time for me to go to the cross. My father hasn't indicated it's time for me uh, uh, to do some magnificent revelation of, of who, he, uh, who I am and what I'm all about. Mary is not uh, thrown off by Jesus's response. Mary says, and this is uh, the first and very significant point in this message. Mary, the Bible says in verse five, says, whatever he tells you, do. And, and then as we go on, we see that Jesus's command is, he tells the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars are filled, he says, dip it out and take it to the master of ceremonies. And the servants followed his instructions. I want to stop there and suggest uh, that that in this story, it ends by saying that the end is gr greater than, than the beginning. If that is going to happen, it requires explicit obedience. Bible tells us that Jesus gives instructions. Mary tells the servants, do whatever Jesus says, and Jesus gives instructions, but his instructions do not immediately make sense to us. Jesus is, uh, the, the problem Jesus faces or the problem that they're facing is there's no wine. The party's going to end. Jesus's instructions are fill the jars with water. And, and then Jesus instructs dip some of the water out of the jar and take it to the master of ceremonies. In other words, his instructions don't necessarily match the problem. Can I suggest that this indicates to us the relevance and significance of obeying and following as our master Jesus leads us? What Jesus is showing is that if there is going to be a change, a transformation, a greater, a, a ladder that is better than our former, it requires us to follow explicitly the leading of our master. It does not simply suggest obeying when it is convenient or when it makes sense to us. There are times in our life and in our journey that it isn't going to make sense to us, but following Jesus does not mean that he has to make it make sense to me or to you. He just has to know what he's doing and we've got to follow. 
can I suggest to each and every one of us, if we are to be called children of the most high followers of Jesus Christ, it requires us to follow not only when it makes sense to us, but even when it doesn't make sense even when the solution doesn't necessarily match the problem. God, I've got a financial burden. And God says, listen, I need you to uh, to, to stop working at this job uh, that is requiring Sabbath observance. Well, wait a minute, God, I got money problems. And yet you want me to do something that's going to cause greater money problems. That don't make sense, God. God, I'm praying for a partner in life, a spouse, a relationship. And, and, and we see individuals that we think would make good sense to us. Yet God says, no, I want you to practice happiness and joy and peace in your singlehood. We say, Jesus, I, I, I'm not understanding why you're calling me to what you're calling me to, because the solution is not matching the problem. But Jesus says, if you are to follow me, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It's got to make sense to me. And not everything that the master will suggest, will command, will will lead us to is going to make sense to us. Sometimes he leads us to uncomfortable places. We don't know if these servants are hired servants or if they're just volunteers, just relatives, family members, what have you. But here's the reality. Jesus isn't the one who's serving the drinks the servants are. If the servants pour water in the jars, and then the servants dip water out of the jars and put it in a cup and take it to the master of ceremonies. And the master of ceremonies drinks the drink. The master of ceremonies is going to insult the servants and insult the groom. But the Bible indicates the master of ceremonies has no idea who told them to do what they're doing. In other words, Jesus ain't going to get blamed for none of it. It requires the servants to be willing to be embarrassed because they're following the leading of Jesus. This whole story doesn't make sense unless there is explicit obedience and confidence in the person, Jesus Christ. For the next two weeks, I'm gonna challenge us that, that following Jesus, what Christianity is all about is explicitly following a person. And it is not just about what makes sense to me or what I like or what is convenient to me. It is about following a person, even when it doesn't make sense. John 11, they say, this dude, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah. And they say, well, you know, Jesus, why don't you come and, and, and you know, you got to see him off if he's about to die or, or can you come and heal him? And, and the Bible says that Jesus delays in going and the disciples are like, dude, what are you doing? The reality is Jesus says this is for the glory of God. In other words, the delay is for God's glory. Sometimes Jesus will lead us in ways that don't make sense to us. But being a Christian is not first and foremost about following a set of rules that make sense, that are logical and, and always reasonable to us. It's about following a person. Now, you might say, well, I don't know if I if I trust that person. Well, I'm, I, you know, why would I follow someone? I don't know for sure if it's going to make sense. I'm glad you, you said that because uh, stories like this are intended to point us to why we can trust and believe and follow this person who may not always make sense to us. Um, I, I want to take you to, to John, the 20th chapter. At the end of that chapter, the Bible talks about, this is after the resurrection, the Bible says that Jesus comes and visits with the disciples, but especially meets with Thomas. Thomas has often been called the doubting uh, disciple because Thomas is like, hey, I ain't going to believe Jesus is alive unless I put my hands in his in the holes in his hands and in his feet and, and, and touch his side. Unless I touch and believe and see, I'm not going to just believe because of what I've heard or, 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 or what has been said to me. And Jesus said, go ahead and touch and put your hand in, into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And then Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe without 
fully seeing me. In other words, he's saying that Christianity, what makes Christianity so amazing is that people follow Jesus and they have some evidence, but not complete evidence. They have something to hang their hat on, but they're not fully sure that everything's going to be all right, that everything's going to work out, but they trust in the person who is leading them, even when it doesn't make sense. And watch this, the disciple uh, the, the, the disciple John says this, it says, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that believing in him and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. In other words, the stuff that's written is to give you enough evidence to trust him, even when it doesn't make all the sense to you. So what happens in the story? You know how the story goes. The Bible says that they fill these water pots up with water. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when the miracle happens. And that is important because faith uh, indicates to us that, that you just obey even when you're not sure. You just keep going even if you don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, for example, Abraham, the Bible says uh, in Genesis, was told to go and sacrifice his son, Isaac. And the Bible says uh, he takes his son and he takes all of the, the wood and all of this stuff. And he goes up to the mountain to offer his son. And, and the Bible says that his servants say to him, um, you know, he says to a servant, sorry, hey, y'all stay here. Me and my son are going up to the mountain to offer sacrifice. And then we, we, plural, are coming back down the mountain. Now, He's going to sacrifice Isaac, yet Abraham says, we are coming back down the mountain. It didn't make sense. How are you going to sacrifice Isaac? And yet we, Isaac and Abraham, are going to come back down the mountain. But faith says, I trust that God's going to work it out, even though I don't fully understand how it's going to work out. And, and and here the Bible says they, they put the water in the jars and, and then the they dip out and put it in a glass. And, and then they take the wine glass that has been filled with water to the master of ceremonies. Now, maybe the miracle happened when they, uh, they poured the water into the ceremonial jars, the 120 to 180 gallons. Maybe the miracle happened as they dipped the, the water out and poured it into the, the goblin, the, the, the wine glass, and, and, and began to take it to the, the, the master of ceremonies. Maybe the miracle happened as they were carrying it. All of a sudden, the water in the glass started to change and transform and become wine. We don't know exactly when the miracle happened, but what we know is their obedience allowed water to at some point become wine. And the Bible says when the master of ceremonies gets this water that has now become wine, he, he drinks the water that has become wine. And the Bible says he indicates it's the best that he has ever had. He says, this isn't the way it normally is. Normally you give your best stuff first. And, and after folk have gotten drunk, after folk have had all of the, the wine that they could, uh, uh, you know, all the wine that they want, and they've, they've uh, become jolly and, and maybe even less uh, fully uh, um, uh, aware of, of what's happening. Y'all know what I mean. You, you get a little tipsy. You, you understand. Uh, uh, for some of us, you know, that's that's a life that we remember well, Lord have mercy. Uh, what the man is saying is after that has happened, that's when you give the, the, the cheap stuff because nobody's going to know it's the cheap stuff. But the master of ceremony says, you have given us the best stuff and, and, and you've given the best stuff after we've drunk all the other stuff. Now you're given the best stuff. And can I suggest that, that when the believer follows and is obedient, even when they don't fully understand how it's going to work out or when it's going to work out, God has a way of taking our obedience and taking our faithfulness. And God has a way of making things better than we could have ever imagined ourselves if we had created the situation ourselves. Watch this. The groom is the one who's going to get embarrassed. 
Don't miss this. The groom is the one who's going to get embarrassed. It's the groom's responsibility to make sure everyone at the wedding feast is well fed and, and has all of the wine that they possibly could want for a whole seven days. The groom is going to get embarrassed that he don't know how to throw a good party if, if the wine runs out. So the way that this works is the groom gives his best in the beginning. The groom gives his second best after his best runs out and people are not as thirsty and uh, or as uh, um, you know cognizant of what's going on. The groom gives his third best, you're getting the picture, and then his fourth best as he's running out, then his fifth best, then his sixth best, and, and he goes through all of his resources till he gets to his absolute worst. In other words, for this to be a crisis indicates that the groom has given his very best all the way down to his absolute worst. But when Jesus, when Jesus is asked to fix the problem, Jesus brings water, a lesser ingredient than the wine. Jesus gives water and makes better than the best that the groom had to offer in the beginning. And can I suggest in some of our lives, if, if only we'd learn to wait on the Lord and be of good courage, we'd realize that if we are patient and we wait on God and are willing to obey as he leads, even when it doesn't always make perfect sense to us, what we'll find is that God has a way of making even better than the very best that we could have produced ourselves if we just wait on the Lord. Sometimes we get ourselves into trouble trying to make better and better when all we need to do is trust and wait for God to give his best. Because when God steps into the situation, God can give better than our best if we just believe. Oh, that's good news, brothers and sisters. Our faith will never be disappointed. Our faith will always be rewarded with God's best if we just believe and trust and obey him. But here's the thing. There's two points I want to make uh, and, and very significant theological points. And I'm going to wrap up this message real quick here. The first significant theological point uh, that, that Jesus uh, and John, I should say, is trying to make in this story uh, and it harkens back to what we talked about last night. Uh, Jesus last night said, destroy the temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. Jesus wasn't talking about a physical structure. He's saying the physical structure is going to get destroyed, but the spiritual structure is about to be destroyed. And it's going to be replaced not by a new religion, but a new way to Almighty God, and that way is through the person, Jesus Christ. His death, his resurrection, provides a new pathway to, to connect with Almighty God. And today's message, this evening's message, in this story in John chapter 2, again, Jesus is showing us, watch this, they're taking the ceremonial containers the containers that are used for washing themselves so that they could be ceremonially clean as they approach God in worship. Jesus is saying, take that symbolic jar, fill it with water, and I'm going to change it and its symbolism into wine, which is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. What Jesus is showing us is there is a transition that happens by the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Theologically, the pathway to Almighty God is not merely through religious traditions. It's not through practices, religious practices and, and, and ceremonies and traditions, uh, even godly traditions, the one that God established. It's not that they're bad, they're just incomplete. They find their fulfillment when they meet up with Jesus. When the ceremonial jars 
are, are placed in the hands of Jesus, Jesus transforms them so that they're not simply used to represent ceremonial cleansing. They're used to represent the wine, which represents the blood of Jesus. That is the new way for us to be cleansed, for us to be made right, for us to be sanctified, for us to be justified, and for us to be uh, uh, glorified. The blood of Jesus is the way to the Father. It's the new way. It, it, it's not a new religion. It's not a, a new set of rules. It's a new path to Almighty God through the blood of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus. But there's a second theologically significant point that is made here, and, and, and you'll see it throughout the book of John. The Bible ends, the, the Bible storyteller, John, ends by saying this miraculous sign was the first Jesus revealed his glory. We read at John 20 that all of the stories are intentionally chosen, handcrafted in order to point us that Jesus is who he says he is. They're signs. Now, is it a miracle? Yes, it's a miracle. But John doesn't use the word miracle. He intentionally uses the word sign. Anyone who has ever driven, you know what a sign is. A sign is not a thing. Uh, it is to point you to a thing. A sign is not the destination. A sign is merely to point you to the destination. A sign is not the locale. It is not where you're trying to go. It is merely to point you into the direction of where you're trying to go. And what Jesus was indicating when he said to his mother, my time has not yet come, he was indicating it's not his time to show who he is yet. It's not his time to die yet. Uh, it's not his time to reveal the new way to God yet. But he does this miracle as a first sign of who he is. The miracle is not what is significant. In fact, it's so insignificant that the people wouldn't have even known who did the miracle. The, 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 the story indicates that the master of ceremonies doesn't go to Jesus and thanks him because he doesn't even know Jesus did a miracle. The servants know that there's a miracle because they served the they took the water and served the master of ceremonies. So they know the miracle. Mary, I'm sure, knows the miracle. Uh, the disciples probably know the miracle, but none of the guests would even know. They're just there enjoying the 120 to 180 gallons of wine that Jesus has, has just made. No one knows who it is who makes it except the people who are behind the scenes. Because it's not his time yet to show who he is. But John tells us when he does this, it is a sign, not just or not a sign per se for the guests who are at the wedding they don't know it's Jesus. It's a sign for us who are readers that indeed Jesus is exactly who John told us he was when he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and was not anything made uh, and, and, and everything that was made was made and nothing that uh, has been made was made by anyone other than him. I didn't get the wording exactly right, but you get the idea. In, in him was light. And the light was the light of men and the light shined in darkness and the darkness could not overthrow it. What John is telling us when Jesus turns water into wine, John is telling us this is the first example to prove to you that Jesus is the creator of, Gen of John 1 verse 1 through 4. That Jesus is the creator from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. That Jesus is able to take uh, 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 something that seems uh, um, uh, that he can take one thing, water, and make it into something else because he's got not just some power, he's got all power. John is showing us this is the first proof in my argument that Jesus is a man, but he's more than just a man. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here to remind us, I don't know who's watching and where you're watching from and what religious traditions you've come from and what your belief systems might be, but I've come to remind us, 
as I have said before, and, and I've illustrated this when I've talked to friends of mine who are not Christian, who are of other faith traditions, whether Muslim or Hindu or whatever the case might be, uh, or no religion, I've come to remind us tonight, you got to do something with this man named Jesus. See, the basics of Christianity always come right back to Jesus. Because if Jesus is just a man, if the stuff that the Bible talks about, uh, you know, maybe these are made up stories, but uh, uh, if Jesus died and Jesus came back to life, you got to do something with Jesus. He's more than just a man if he died and came back to life. That's the greatest sign. John is making his case and, and, and his case begins by saying, Jesus went to a wedding and he turned water to wine. I saw it with my own eyes. I was in the background as Jesus told the servants to, to put water into the, 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 the jars and then draw it out. And I heard with my own ears the, the master of ceremony say, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. And John is making the case. I've seen it. I've heard it. This is the first evidence. He's a man, but he's more than just a man. And Anyone on planet Earth is going to have to do something with this information because if he's more than just a man, it's not just another religion. Christianity is about a person who is Superman. A person who is more than ordinary, who's more than a prophet, who's more than Mary's son, Mary's baby, who's more than just a Galilean, who's more than just someone born in Bethlehem, someone reared in Nazareth. He's more than just that, more than just John's cousin and more than just some dude who had 12 followers. He's more than just somebody who was killed and crucified on Golgotha's hill. He's more than just a good teacher who, who preached on the mountaintops and and had lots of, uh, of followers and, and had good sayings and good ideas. He's all of that and more. John says, this is my first proof, my first evidence that he's more than just a man. And brothers and sisters, if you're listening to this message, I'm challenging you. You've got to make a decision what you're going to do with Jesus. I ain't talking about a denomination. I'm not asking you to, to, to join a denomination, to follow a set of rules. I'm challenging you. If you believe what this book says, he's more than just a man. If you don't believe what this book says, that's fine. You got to make a decision uh, about this dude named Jesus because his followers watched him die. He's a real historical figure. His followers watched him die. And then they say, because he's alive, we ain't scared of dying no more. You've got to make a decision what you're going to do with this man named Jesus. I don't care who you are and what traditions you come from. Jesus becomes the line in the sand of the line of demarcation. You got to make a decision what you do with Jesus. Every religion got some good ideas. I have read uh, the, the Quran cover to cover. It's got great ideas. I've read um, the, the Hindu. I forgot the, the, the name of the book right now, uh, but I haven't read it cover to cover, but I have read some of it uh, translated into English. I've read some great ideas. There are other religious traditions. I haven't necessarily read all of their um, uh, religious books, but they have great ideas and, 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 and awesome leaders and founders of those religious traditions. I'm not saying don't follow uh, some of the stuff in those traditions. They have great morals uh, and ethical um, uh, statements that are made that are great for any and everyone to follow. I'm not saying don't follow that. It's great. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But the question is not about a good set of rules to follow or a good set of practices to have. My question is, what are you going to do with this man named Jesus? Because if Jesus is just a man, fine. Choose any, any religion that you like. But if Jesus is indeed more than just a man, we're not called just to follow some rules. We're called to follow a person who died, but he came back to life. And as I like to say all the time, if he died and he came back to life, he won. I don't care what the game is, he's the winner. Because nobody else has done that. No one else says, I'm going to die and then I'm going to get myself back up in three days. Nobody's done that. Nobody can do that. You've got to make a decision. John says, this is my first proof that Jesus is more than just a man. 
brothers and sisters, we got to make a decision what we're going to do with this man named Jesus. Now, indeed, Jesus cares about our everyday life. He attended a wedding. That's a wonderful message. Uh, indeed, if we obey, Jesus will, will take that faith that he can make our latter better than our former. Indeed, the lesson in the text is to remind us that Jesus is overshadowing the Jewish religious traditions and ceremonies. Not that they are bad, but they are not the complete or the best way to God. Just like all the religious traditions have ways to God and they're wonderful. But what Jesus is showing us is the best way comes through the blood of Jesus. There's no comparison. It overshadows the traditions of, of Judaism. But brothers and sisters, John's main point is simple. This is a sign to remind us. This is the first proof to remind us Jesus is more than just a man. Christianity, it's very basic. We don't simply follow a set of rules. We follow a person. And that person's name is Jesus. It's not Pastor Carl. It's not the elders. It's not, it's not even the, the members of the church, even as holy and godly as some might be. It's, it's not them. We follow a person and his name is Jesus. The question is, what are we going to do with this man named Jesus? Because he is more than just a man. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for reminding us what happens when we place our faith and our trust in you. You have a way of not only not embarrassing us, like the groom who was worried, perhaps, that embarrassment was coming. Not only will we not be embarrassed or ashamed, but Lord, you can make our latter better than our former. You can make the end better than the beginning. You can transform our story so that uh, we end up with greater than we could have even imagined. In fact, the groom had already given his best, and with water, you overshadowed his best. Lord, if we just trust and wait, we'll realize that how you can transform our situation, our circumstances, you can change our story and make our latter better than our former. But Lord, the story is not just about what can happen with faith. It's also to remind us to have faith in you, in you, in the person, Jesus Christ because you are indeed more than just a man. So Lord, tonight, as we've gotten the first sign, Lord, I pray that it would direct us towards this person named Jesus. May our hearts and our minds be drawn toward him. May we learn to follow him, which is life eternal. Until we meet again, God, keep us this evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen.